This is the Unearthing Art Podcast with Michelle Luminato and Beck Lee, where we dig into the messy reality of making art that matters, raw and real conversations about being an artist, navigating the creative process, and expressing our honest and sometimes weird selves. Tell me about your studio stuff. (laughs) How are you doing? Was it fun? It was fun. It was a thousand times less difficult than all the time I was procrastinating. (laughs) (laughs) How funny. It it does work that way, doesn't it? Yes, yes. And um, I think that what I've been doing in the studio is probably a bit of a living example of what you want to talk about today. Yes. Which is the 80-20 principle yes. because I was holding back and holding back and thinking, oh, I don't know how I'm going to work this out. I need someone to give me the answers. It's going to be too hard. It's going to be a lot of effort. I was like imagining how big it was going to be. And then it was a really delightful maybe two or three hours, mm-hmm. really delightful two or three hours. And I have a completely transformed perspective on that <laughs> problem. That we yep. mulled over for a whole episode. <laughs> you, I spent more time, I'm, so I'm, much more time worrying about that than I did <laughs> actually just doing the thing and discovering, hey, I know. I But I love that. Like, I think there's so much good stuff that comes from awareness of just how mm. we're operating, you know, and I think that we don't even understand how ineffective we are. We spin in these circles and we don't even... We're like, I can't get out of this circle. And you're like, you know, you just can't see it. So, yeah, I think today's topic of the 80-20 rule would be excellent. I guess just to backtrack a little bit for the listeners who may not have heard of Pareto Principle, I think it is. And yep. and really, it's like the 80-20 rule. And I was thinking about that because it's been a business principle that was introduced to me years ago. And I I've looked at you know, a lot of circumstances where I'm like, how is this applied in my life? There's lots of examples I have, but one of them was I looked at revenue or sales that came from a certain product line in our stationary business. And it was definitely Mm -hmm. 20% of that product line. I look at all of the clothing I have in my closet. I wear like 20% of the whole entire closet. And in my studio practice out of that color, you know, all the color inspiration that I have that I'm looking at right now, it's really the 20%, you know, that is really bringing out the best of my work. And I just think that's a really fascinating idea because if we look at that a little bit closer, we can start to make it really be useful. Cause I'm like, do I need all of that hundred percent of clothing in my closet? So the Pareto principle the idea originally came from an economist. What we might think about when we look at the world and we look at some effort that we're doing or some work that we're doing, or like you say, a wardrobe, or when we look at anything at all, we might tend to think that everything's kind of distributed evenly, like everything's on a graph, a flat line. So as you say, I've got a wardrobe, I'm sure that I, I wear all of those things equally. The original economist was looking at, um, he was growing peas in his garden. He was looking at his harvest and you might assume, well, I'm in a farm, I'm growing pea pods. I have a hundred plants and I harvest it and I, and at the end of the day, I have like a thousand peas or whatever it is. I'm getting 10 per plant. That's how we think of it in a very distributed way. But what he noticed was that 80% of the harvest was coming from 20% of the plants. So the idea being that instead of things being very evenly distributed, like we might assume, and we talk about assumptions a lot, that when you start to analyze and really look at where of this whole thing that I'm looking at, what percentage is giving me the majority of the results? I hope I've yeah, tried to kind of that, I that love that. Bit. I love that you brought up the once again gardening analogy because <laughs> if you think of the harvest though, I mean think of it, it's just we harvest art, you know, we harvest mm-hmm. concepts, ideas and paintings. And so if we look at what are those activities, you know, because I think it's more than what's fruitful, but what are the activities that give us the best fruit? you know, give Mm -hmm. us that Mm -hmm. rich 
part that gives us the best harvest. I think that's really what we could talk about more today is what are those activities. And I think that one of the things that we've talked about is like as an employee kind of mindset people who were trained to be employees, we think, well, if we just yep. show up, we just do the activities, we ha- we work hard, and we have this sort of like, we just keep adding things on, and we're just mm-hmm. busy, you know, and it's like, it's it's really full. And I just want to really question today, like, what are the actual activities that are the most useful, you know, to really yeah. harvest not only, you know, our best work, but how do we harvest work that gives us a better art offer as well? Meaning yeah. how do we make that more useful for the people who are collecting our art? Do you know what I mean? Totally, totally. And the eighty twenty principle is from an, uh, the mind of an economist. And it's used a lot, as you say, in the business world, Michelle, looking at things like profitability and income and productivity in terms of workforces and stuff like that. But I think you can also use it at a very kind of human and qualitative level as well. Like you can look at it in terms of your own quality of life. We're not just talking about profits and money, but your quality of life in terms of if you look at your day-to-day life and where you're getting most satisfaction, you might find that, you know, there's a certain percentage of your really highest happiness activities that are the things that really make your life worth living. Yeah. (laughs) You know, not in a a dark way, but really light you up and you're like, that's what I look forward to. And then these are these other activities that you kind of keep doing. And unless you think about that and really um, reflect on it in a write it down kind of way, see it on paper. What are my 10 major activities that I do in my life and which two of those are actually the most important to me? Yeah. And think about how much time you put into those because it makes sense that instead of putting an equal amount of time, like 10%, 10%, 10%, and all 10 of those things, why not put like 20%, 25% into those two things that are the most rewarding, like personally rewarding things and try and either get rid of if you really don't want to do the other things anymore or minimize reduce the amount of time once you start thinking like this there's a lot of ways you can use it to make decisions and I think today and talking about this principle when you said you wanted to talk about this Michelle it really resonated with me because I think it's another way to think about decision making which is actually what we've been talking about for the last two episodes yeah, <laughs> we were talking yeah. about me struggling with decision making and you know trusting your gut and then we were talking about um, self-trust and trusting the process in the studio and how you use that to make better decisions and now we're looking at analyzing what you're putting in and to what area versus what you're getting out, whether that's in a productivity terms, income terms, the offer that you make, how you feel about your art, how you feel about your practice, how much satisfaction you're getting. So I'm really excited. Yeah. What you're saying is is really completely in line what I was thinking about too. And I think when we can start doing this from a more conscious level and and like you said, start eliminating the things that don't give us that. They're just not necessary. We can let them go. I think this is true for even, I'm going to go off on a little tangent. So reel me back in Beck. But I feel like, you know, when we say I'm so interested in all these things, I love, you know, I'll just use myself as an example. I love abstract expressionism. I love loose, crazy lines. I love um, geometrics. I love sculptural. How am I going to fit that all in? If, If I really step back, you know, really, really step back and start really separating what gives me the most joy. That's where that 20%, I think, starts bubbling up in those ideas as well. It's not that I don't like all these things, but is it the thing that's going to give me the most satisfaction, the most exploration for me to dive deeper into that 20%? Does that make sense? I'm going to double down. I'm going to say, not not (laughs) not only is that not a tangent, I think that is so spot on and you've you've um, inspired me saying it like that actually because 
I think I think about writing and editing and the idea that when you have a piece of writing or a poem or whatever it is um, and you might have a lot in there that you love but when you think so what's the impact that I want to have with this Mm -hmm. it's really important that you have to edit and lose some of that because in order to have the maximum impact with the 20% that remains and I guess it's because what's coming to my mind is like otherwise it's sort of a dilution of effort and a dilution of energy so Mm -hmm. say that example with the economist and his pea pod harvest the idea being that when he realizes that you know 20% of the harvest is accounting for 80% of the peas that he gets at the end of the season so if he then focuses on that 20% and really, you know, optimizes those plants and make sure they're they're getting the best water and the best fertilizer and that so to make the sweetest peas, he's gonna have a great harvest. But if he continues to spread his effort across to all a hundred percent, then everything is a little bit more average. And mm-hmm. I think that's it's just amazing how many ways you can apply this. So when we think about our art whether it's writing, whether it's a painting and the impact it can have, like what you're saying, you can be committed to those 10 things that you love and you're like, I'm going to get them all in, give equal attention to all 10 of those things. Or you can go, what are the two things that if I get really, really great, are just going to just blow the top off people's heads and just hit them and, and it's going to communicate what I want and it's going to land with them and it's, not going to be diluted by having this other 80% kind of on the same canvas or other 80% of words kind of crowding it. Like that's, I love that. Oh, totally. (laughs) And I think, I think that that's, um, that is something that not only diluting it, but confusing, you know, when we're trying to say too many things. And this is where I always go back. Anyone who's been in origin art and been around me for a while, they know I'm all about like, how do you want it to feel? What's that feeling that you want people to have? And I Mm -hmm. think this is where we have to start becoming more clear on what kind of feeling do we want to express? You know, what kind of Mm -hmm. energy are we passing along in our art? And if you're mixing all these ideas at once, it can come across as confusing. So Mm -hmm. I think if we can start to look at how can we hone in on that 20% to go, well, this is what I really want it to feel like. And that might mean that we let go of the rest. And again, it doesn't mean forever, just means maybe in this one piece. The other thing that I was thinking of, Beck, was about your experience in the studio this week. I wanted to hear about how that applies to what your experience was. What we just described there is very much where I'm at at the moment. I have a number of elements elements in terms of the media that I'm using, writing pieces, collage pieces, paint pieces. How do I bring these together? And um, I was really agonizing over that. And I had been allowing that to be a block for a little while and procrastinating actually going into the studio and seeing what might happen because I couldn't pre-solve that problem in my mind. And then uh, I messaged you, Michelle, over the weekend to say, oh, look, here's some yeah. pictures of what I've been doing in the studio, all of maybe two or three hours work. And <laughs> it's a whole new world. <laughs> I was actually thinking yesterday, um, how am I going to do my next step? And I know what I want to do. I want to get this piece with that piece. And how can I do some experiments with that? How can I simplify the way that I work with this just so I can start coming up with some new solutions and I caught myself thinking that way and thought this is a hundred miles from where I was just a week ago because at that point I wasn't thinking what's the next step and coming up with solutions in my mind I was just stuck at this wall of these two things will never go together. What I saw too is in the past even a year ago you had this big amount of source of elements or inspiration and and you know there's a lot to it and then you've kind of honed into this 20 percent that now to me looks very much like beck and then when you use that as a springboard in the studio it took so little effort because 
it was so channeled through you. Am I right? Is that? Yes. Actually, it came together so quickly. It kind of felt like slipping on a pair of shoes, really comfortable shoes that I used to wear, but I hadn't put on in a while. So it actually just, it felt like I was just slipping back into the rhythm of the studio. It's also really funny because what I ended up painting um, reminded me a lot of stuff that I'd done two years ago. But doing it now with everything I've learnt in that intervening time, with the perspective and the kind of focus I have now, like you said, Michelle, um, I hadn't thought of it that way, but zooming in more onto the 20% and being clearer in myself about why I had chosen that 20% and what it means to me now. So rather than feeling like I'm just pushing paint around, I'm feeling really... I don't want to say like deliberate or focused because that also sounds kind of controlled and limited. But yeah, I'm feeling really, let's say in the flow. Yes. So I guess there's that sensation of ease. Yeah. We do get a little uncomfortable with that ease, don't we? It seems like... Yeah, it does feel... It's like, is it supposed to be this easy? And you said you were procrastinating and I don't think Mm. that we all know what that was like for you because we're not with you. Sometimes we build these things up to be more difficult because of all the past experiences that we've had. But when we start to let go of the things that aren't really, you know, that 20% that really is us, Mm -hmm. it's just there is this Mm -hmm. ease that kind of comes through. And what I want to say that I see is that you you have that experience now to build on. You're like, oh, last mm. time I went in, there was ease. Maybe it will be a little bit easier next time instead of it being like, oh my gosh, it's going to be so difficult. Yeah, maybe that's part of what I felt like when I described what I was thinking about afterwards. It was just taking another block down. That's what I feel like my kind of journey has been yep. <laughs> to use all, that all of somewhat us. cliched word it's it's the journey of just taking one block down at a time and then as you do it you um you go oh here I found some more blocks but each time it can get a little <laughs> bit easier to do so I was really thinking to myself I'll tell you Michelle I was a, a little bit stunned with myself when I was thinking about it yesterday I was thinking have I ever felt this aligned Did we use the word aligned yet? That's what it felt like. Have I ever felt this aligned? I I thought that I was before, but each time it's like a new level of alignment. I'm feeling very in the groove, like magic's going to happen, I think. And I I think, you know, with the 80-20 analysis of it too, we can feel a little disconcerted when things feel easy. Because sometimes I think the 80-20 thing feels like a bit of a cheat, Mm -hmm. you know, like shouldn't we be putting in 100%, 100% of the time? I think we do accidentally stumble into this 80-20 thing in our day-to-day lives. You know, like sometimes you have times when everything feels like a real slog. Mm -hmm. And um, you put in a lot of, you like, you spend a whole week working at something and you feel like you've got nowhere. Mm -hmm. And then at other times, like what I've just described in the studio, you lose sense of time, you fall into like a flow state, a whole bunch of stuff gets done amazingly quickly. You look up and, and you're like, oh, it's, I've actually made much more progress in this morning than I have over the last week. That I think is 80-20. That's mm-hmm. it in practice mm-hmm. because it's the the right kind of effort on the right problem or the right activity and suddenly you're getting a lot back out of it. And we kind of can do that accidentally, but we're talking about doing it a bit more consciously. But at the same time, yeah, it can feel a bit guilty at times for some reason because we yes. have that cultural yeah. ethic about, oh, we should have to slog more or we have it to put needs that to be hard, hard and when it feels good, mm. yeah, we don't deserve it. I think the other thing too is when I look at the 80-20, and again, I think there's a lot of ways to translate this, but when I look at it, I'm like, okay, well, if I've just discovered you know, 20%, and I like to call that 20% like the gold, you know, that comes Mm -hmm. from those experiments. And I'm like, if I put 100% into that 20%, I feel like then it becomes this really mining possibility of 
exploration and it just keeps getting better and better and better because when you put 100% into that tight 20% of clarity, you know, it then you look at that and you're like, well, where's the 20% in that? You know what I mean? What you're going to be doing next, which is taking all these other elements, all these mm. elements, and really start looking at how they come together. And yeah. you're going to explore ideas and there'll be this 100% of ideas, but there'll be like 20% that you're probably going to be like, that's the gold. That's what I'm going right, to go dig into. Right. You've talked before about going into the studio to fail. Yes. You're going in knowing and expecting that 80% you're not going to continue with. Yes. It's the 20%. Because when you go into the 20% and put your effort there, it opens up again because it is it is the stuff that's yielding so much to, mm -hmm. to open up into in terms of what I'm doing right now. What I did on the weekend for just two or three hours, tick, success. I, I looked at those things. It showed me what I had in mind that I couldn't have known until I actually did it. Now I know much more the materials, the consistency of the paint and, and what I'm going for there. What I'm really curious about and what really fascinates me now is how these things are going to fit together. And I really don't know how that's going to be. I haven't been able to find any other examples, whether art-based or even elsewhere, to give me a strong pointer or, you know, a strong roadmap as to how this is going to happen. And I am really curious because I think what I want to do is possible, but I have no map for it. But I have these really tuned in tools now that we've filtered through. I've got my 20% narrowed down toolbox so I don't have a lot of uncertainty around that. I'm like, okay, I can do it with this, 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 and this. And I think this is such a great example of when we get to create our own examples, like sometimes we're like, I can't find examples or I'm looking for this. And, and then I've always had that realization like, oh, well, I'm meant to do that. I'm meant to create mm. that example and be that example. And I think this is a perfect example of you yeah. really looking at, how you're going to really study these because now you're really going into mining this harvesting in a way like Bex planted her seeds of peas. She's going to harvest. This is what, this is like the topsy turvy thing I was talking about. Yes. And whenever we, we get into things, it always blows my mind um, because we make these assumptions that things are very, as I said, a hundred percent, you know, evenly, everything's evenly distributed. Therefore, if that was the case, you think, well, if I'm losing 80%, and Beck say, you know, she's only got these sort of 20% tools. So she's got like five or six things that she's playing with now. Well, that must be very limiting. Like she's let go of a whole bunch of stuff. It must be only a very few things that can happen. But actually, once we started talking about it, I was in a very animated way <laughs> saying to Michelle, and I could have, so this element, I could actually break out again now and find, you know, it could be done this way, it could be done that way, it could be done this and this. So it's the paradox of it that the more you go down into that 20%, you know, like that 20% of great producing pea pods, then you start going, okay, how can I work with this 20%? How can I fine tune the fertilizer? How yeah. can I get the irrigation just right? Like, And I think it's because you're able to put your attention on it, isn't it? Yeah. So rather than having this whole um, canvas, and we often talk about that feeling and artists say, I stand in front of a canvas and I, there's just so many things I could do, I feel completely overwhelmed. Yeah, I'm not sure. So then I get frozen to do anything. But if you can find that 20%, that's the gold and also that you are fascinated with. Yes. It opens up, as you say, to a whole 100%. I'm going to get even more it's specific. I'm going to go. go again and again, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is where I'm like, the gold is in the gold because it, it seems like it would narrow our focus, but I have not found that to be true. I found that you like the possibilities are just wide open, but that's because we are so focused and, mm. and focused meaning clarity of mm. that feeling, clarity of what's important to us. We've let go of yep. the rest and therefore the variations that we can 
kind of come up with, they're going to last a lifetime because they're they're not limited. You know, it's really like a Pandora's box where I feel like once we actually get the Pandora's box, like I think the, yeah. the, the biggest hurdle is opening Pandora's box and finding it, you know, mm-hmm. but I think that mm-hmm. has a lot to do with leaving the rest behind. But once we open yes. it up, it's more, it's just huge. It's huge. Yeah. But it's also encouraging because even if you don't get to that right now, you know, and, and Beck's going to discover, I'll bet you in another couple episodes. Yeah, I'll be going, Michelle, I've got She's going to be like, I've got 20 different things I could do. And then we're going to be <laughs> like, well, which two are calling you right now? Because it doesn't mean that yeah. she has to do everything right now. But because of the way that she might be feeling about something, the mood she wants to put put into her art, you know, that that message really that's coming through, those will call up 20%. It's not going to call up the 100% of variations. It's only going to call up the 20%. And I think when we start understanding how powerful it can be, and then leaving those options that we were happy with, but we didn't use, we can use them again later, you know? Yes, that's the other thing. It's not it's always like I've said before it's never a waste I think it's also really good news for artists who might be feeling you know really challenged in terms of time and energy yes that's something I, I feel very challenged in terms of energy at times um I know others uh, you know have got a, such a busy lives and they're they're trying to fit art in and they're really challenged in terms of time so it's super positive because it means that of the available energy and time that you have what we're saying is put a hundred percent of that into the gold that we're talking about into the 20 percent and what it does is it means that you spend less time feeling kind of disheartened like you're not making progress so that the whatever you have whatever resources you have you can be in that 20% excited, like really rocketing progress, let's say, and and discovery and all that kind of stuff. Totally. And it's funny because the more I do this, the less time I actually need in the studio, which does make me feel a little guilty. But I have to say, when you still feel excited about it, you know, because I was just geeking out with my husband I'm like come look and um I was showing him he goes I love the way you're so excited like it's the first time you've ever seen it and I think that's because it is stuff that I really care about and when you can see Mm. that vision come through from like just a little seed and then you can start planting it and growing it and harvesting it and then it can come through that's when you get excitement, you know what I mean? And it doesn't yeah, go away. Like Lola's, like Lola's excitement right now. She <laughs> tippy taps around Lola. behind you. Sorry, our little, our little doggy here, she just has to walk around and be part of it. She's, she's feeling the 80-20. She um, <laughs> I will say from an outsider's perspective, when I'm in that space of stuckness that we've talked about, when I'm kind of procrastinating or feeling really, you know, in a lot of, for a lot of different reasons we've talked about before and we'll no doubt talk about again. But it can feel really difficult and time consuming at the same time. Like it can feel like a big effort, like you're making big efforts, but getting nowhere. And then um, when I look at artists who are not in a, and I'm not talking about in a comparison, oh, they're better than me or not better than me, but like when I look at you, Michelle, and when you're really hitting your stride with something you're excited about, like what you're doing now, and I think, oh, you know, you must have so much time in the studio. and I, Because in my mind, I'm equating, if I'm not making progress now, that the progress that I need to make means that I need to be putting in more time Mm -hmm. But actually, I'm just kind of reinforcing what you just said. Your progress is coming from focusing on the gold and you're working in your like gold zone. Let's call Mm -hmm. it that, the gold zone. When you're not in that zone and you're feeling like exhausted because it feels like an uphill battle, like you're pushing that boulder up the hill and you're like, how can I ever make more progress with my art when I'm so exhausted right now and I don't have the time or I don't have the energy and... I guess the message is you actually don't necessarily need more time and energy. What you need is to 
stop having these energy leaks and time leaks on this stuff that's not working on the 80 percent on the not useful stuff i don't know if that's made any sense at all i think um and apologies for lola she's very busy today walking around um (laughs) i absolutely for one i have felt like i've been pushing a a boulder up a hill in my art so Mm -hmm. i totally get that feeling and i do have to say i do have a little bit of guilt with how easy and not easy but like there's ease there's flow there's happiness there's joy and again it's not that i'm not make i'm still making bad stuff i'm still having mistakes but i'm much more you know letting them go quicker um, mm-hmm. so that I can focus on the gold. But the other thing too, is my life is so full. Like I can't even tell you how yeah. full my life is. And so I don't have, you know, eight hours a day or even six and four is like, a. if I strike gold for four hours at one session, I feel really like, woohoo. Um, but yeah. so I don't have a lot of time. I really don't. And so for me, it became even more critical to look at what, what is the gold? What can I mm-hmm. dig into that will be more useful than me just going in there generically, you know, mm. just being in the studio? Because I think what you were explaining, like, oh, well, maybe because I am you know, struggling, I need more time in the studio and I need more yeah. effort. And that's really that old work harder, you know, not smarter. And this is more yeah. around like, well, how can we be smarter with our time? You know, how can we be more resourceful with our creativity? Mm-hmm. How can we allow things to bubble up? So yeah, I, I, I just find little pockets of time, but I'm super intentional about, you know, how connected I am to it. I think that's really Mm. the important thing too with this, you know, gold. Why am I working out of my gold zone? Because I I care about it. I really care about it. This is the other part that I think this is why I'm really excited right now is each time I do it, like as Beck said, you know, each time I do it, there's more of me that comes out and Mm. less of anyone else more like, and I'm seeing myself more and, and when I allow myself to live at my full potential mm-hmm. and not shortcut it because I don't have time, I'm too busy, I think that mm. that's when we kind of start to live in this, like, this is, this is it. This is the gold. Uh, sorry, yeah. I went off on a tangent and so did Lola. <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> and... I just wondered if you wanted to also say something because we didn't really get to talk about, or maybe we did, the 80-20 in terms of how then that comes through as an offer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we need to have that as a another episode because I do think yeah. there's a lot, a lot I have to say about that. I yeah. think that just the short version in this is that we should talk about that again and why it's important is one as artists i think that it can be really challenging to find our most profitable journey as artists Mm. um Mm -hmm. you know as an art offer for collectors who are willing to pay more which is our Mm -hmm. most profitable journey that's where we want to really align with what we want to do with what matters to them and that's hundred percent looking at the 20 percent so let's yeah let's talk about that more Before we go today, we've been talking a lot about how do we get to that 20%? How do we ask those good questions? And I've got something really fun coming up. And I want to invite you to a free coaching week where I am going to actually share with you much more about the artist breakthrough blueprint. And in that, we're going to talk about how to really find your zone of genius and how to design breakthroughs for yourself so that you can find the 20% that actually matters to you. So check out the show notes and go look for the link that says the artist breakthrough blueprint and join us over there. Mm -hmm.